just one word You call the storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes are open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can't do There's not a mountain that He can't move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do Just one word you heal what's broken inside me Just one word And you revive every dream You're Just one touch I feel the power of heaven Yeah, just one touch My eyes are open to see my heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can't do There's not a mountain that He can't move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do Oh, there's nothing that our God can't do There's not a prison wall He can't break Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do oh. I will believe for greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like His power There's nothing that our God can't do There's not a mountain that He can't move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do prison wall he can't break through oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can't do oh. One of the favorite games that my children had as they were young was hide and go seek. I would count to 10 very slowly, and then after we reached the magic number of 10, I'd say, ready or not, here I come. And as I opened my eyes, most often I knew where the children were. I could hear them giggle, or I could hear them whisper, or moving around but I would act like I couldn't find them and then be very surprised by where they had hidden. 
Well, sometimes I think as adults, we try to play hide and seek with God. Maybe we try to hide things from him that are in our lives that are not good things, things that are destructive. And uh, we think if we just get busy enough, or perhaps if we just ignore it, that God won't see that in our lives. But the fact is, God knows exactly where we are in our life at all times. So as we come together for this communion, we know that God knows who we are. He knows right where we are at in our life journey. And this is a wonderful opportunity for us to come before God and lay all of our weaknesses, all of our sin, any shortcomings we have right at his feet, knowing that God has loves us so much that he sent his only son who gave his life on that cross so that our sins could be forgiven, but not only that our sins would be forgiven, but that we can live a new abundant life because of Jesus, because of the power of the resurrected Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to give us new life, the opportunity to be able to call you Father. And Father, we thank you that even though you know everything about us, the good, the bad, and the ugly, Father, we thank you that you love us and that we can come before you confessing our weakness, confessing where we fall short, where we have sinned against you, and can receive forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you are always here for us. And we thank you and praise you during this communion time for what Christ has done for us. In his name we pray, amen. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come now as you are, as you want to be. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come now. Tired, broken, scared, or just in need Ready or not, it's alright Take your time or nothing else, just come Like the now, 
Welcome to Central today. My name is Andy Beatty. I'm the teaching minister here at Central. Glad to have you along with us for our series that we're calling Directions. We're talking about how the choices that we make now determine the path we go on, or the choices we make now determine the stories that we'll tell later on. You know, it's kind of like watching a scary movie. With a scary movie, you watch as uh, these victims just continually make terrible choices after terrible choices, right? They run upstairs to hide instead of running to the safe place outside or running to their car or some, you know, or they run to the creepy basement. You know, it it always drives me crazy when they run upstairs and and they hide under the bed or in the closet or, you know, something like that. It's like, they're gonna look there. Like they're gonna find you. Right. And, and it's also, you watch these movies and it's so frustrating because you, you see these and it's so obvious who the bad guy is. And yet these people continually make bad choices, uh, not seeing the obvious things that are sometimes right in front of their face over and over and over again we watch as they make bad decisions now it makes for good television most of the time but if that's your life well it's a little different right in our lives sometimes we make great decisions stories that we're proud to tell about things that we're we're excited to, to share with other people and then there's times that we make some decisions that we'd rather just rip those chapters out and pretend like they don't exist 
Uh, we, we've been talking about those decisions, those choices that we make. The first week we talked about starting something small, deciding to start something and start small, start with some new discipline, some new habit. Uh, then the next week we decided to stop something, right? To, to choose something in our life to stop. It could be sin. You know, a lot of times that's the really obvious stuff, but we also talk about how we can actually be doing good things, but things that are just not done in a wise way and they're exhausting us or wearing us out. Uh, Last week we talked about choosing to stay when it would be so much easier to walk away. This week I'm going to challenge you that sometimes the best decision you can make is to go when it would be more comfortable to stay. Sometimes the best decision we can make is to follow the call of God, take a step of faith, choose to go when it would be so much easier to stay and live in comfort. Now, I want you to make sure you're using wisdom here with this, because last week we were talking about literally the opposite, right? Choosing to stay uh, when it's easier to go. And and we looked at an example of Ruth and Naomi and, and, and how that plays out there. And I just want to encourage you, use wisdom with this. Consider the context of these stories. Consider the context of your life. uh, And and remember uh, that not all situations are the same, right? So, So today, I'm going to challenge you to take a step of faith. I'm going to challenge you to go when it would be more comfortable to stay. There are a lot of stories in the Bible uh, that we could use to illustrate this, but I'm going to pick one that especially sticks out to me. It's the story of Abraham and Sarah. Now, if you know their story, their backstory, Abraham and Sarah were worshiping a false god. They were worshiping a false god in the Ur of Chaldees, okay, this, this, this place where they were living. And so he's living in this land, worshiping a false god, and then the one true god comes to him. It gives him a very simple yet very direct command. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, The Lord has said to Abraham, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. So leave, leave what you know, and go. If you're using a paper Bible, I want you to underline leave and go. Leave and go. Now, this seems ridiculously obvious, and it almost seems like low-hanging fruit, but I'm going to say it anyways. To go somewhere else, you have to leave where you're at, right? To go somewhere else, you have to leave behind what you know, what you're comfortable with, what is easy. To step forward and to to fulfill what God has called you to do, you're going to have to step away from your security, from your comfort. And that's true in almost every context. Think about the Battle of Jericho. You know, it's like, hey, leave the safety of your own camp and go march around this fortified cities with these huge walls playing instruments. Or Jonah, hey, you need to fulfill your calling, you need to go to Nineveh and preach this very challenging message. Or think about the disciples. Hey, leave your fishing, leave your family, leave your careers, and go follow Jesus. Or think about Jesus. Hey, leave heaven, leave the comfort and protection of living with God and go to earth, take on the the form of, of man and be crucified. See, for us to fulfill our calling for the Lord, we will be forced to step away from the comfort of our life. If you're ever going to do something big for God, you're going to have to leave some of your comfort behind at some point. Think about Abraham. He's been told to leave the place he knows, to leave the friends he has, to leave his religion, religion, leave his family, leave your old way of doing things, leave all of these things that you know and that you trust, and go to a land that God's going to reveal to him. God is calling him out of his comfort zone, and he's calling him to a place that he knows nothing about. And God simply makes this promise. If, if we read on, so Genesis chapter 12, look at verses 2 and 3 now. He says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. Verse 3 says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now, Abraham could have gone, what? There's going to be nations coming from us? God, don't you realize we have zero kids? I'm 75 years old, and, and we've been trying, but we're childless. And you're telling me there's nations that are going to come from me? I think it would have been easy to be skeptical, right? And to say, okay, you want me to leave and you're going to have nations come. Like, why don't you give me a kid first, then I'll leave, right? Like a contractual agreement. Here's the thing. I don't know if you've ever made promises to God. 
I have. I, I used to do it all the time. Things like, uh, okay, God, if, if you help me find this book that I lost, I will never be irresponsible again. God, if you help me pass this test, I promise I will study for the next one. God, if you help me to not get arrested at this peewee football game, I promise to never yell at the refs again. You know, through the years, I've made promises like that. And I'm willing to bet that you've probably made promises like that to God at some point in your life. But here's the thing. When we make those promises to God, we don't actually change. Like, I still was irresponsible at times. I still procrastinated on tests. Uh, I, I still have a slight tendency to yell at referees occasionally, okay? We're not changed by the promises that we make to God. We're changed when we believe the promises that God made to us. We're changed, we're different. We are different when we believe the promises that God has made to us, not the other way around. And so God makes this promise to Abraham. And what does he do? Well, he makes a detailed map laying all the possible, all the possible scenarios and backup plans, consults a shaman to give him advice, researches it for years and years, but never actually does anything. No, he doesn't do any of those things. Look at Genesis 12, verse 4. It says, So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. So stop for just a minute and consider what would have happened if Abraham didn't go. If Abraham had rationalized it all out and said, you know what, I'm 75 years old. This is the place I know. This is the place I live. I'm comfortable here. I don't have kids yet. Uh, she's not pregnant. So, you know, it seems like what you're saying doesn't make sense. It seems kind of scary. It seems kind of overwhelming. I'm safe. I'm comfy. I'm cozy here. If Abraham had rationalized it a lot of the times the way that we do, there'd be no Isaac, there'd be no Jacob, there'd be no Joseph, there'd be so many untold stories if Abraham didn't have the faith to obey God. God's work would have still been accomplished, but Abraham, his family, his generations, those blessings that came through him, it would all be different. So I want to encourage you. There's going to come a time in your life when God will stir your heart, when he's going to call you out, when he's going to challenge you to take a step of faith, to leave where you are, and if you have faith to do it, do something big. And if you don't have faith to do it, but instead by fear you choose to ignore God's calling, you can't even imagine the blessings that you're going to miss if you don't obey God. Like, we have no idea what we miss out on when we ignore God's stirrings, when we ignore God's calling. And that's why sometimes the best decision that we can make is to go when it would be easier to stay. And I think for almost every one of us, if we were to step back in our lives, if we were to look at the things that we do, the things we don't do, the thoughts we have, the, the, the things from God, you know, we read scripture and we see these things and we kind of suppress these things. I think that if we were willing to acknowledge those things, we would know that there are things in our life that need to change. There are things that we need to do differently, that we need to be more bold about. I think if we step back and we ask ourselves, what does God want me to want? I think a lot of us would be shocked with the way that we choose to live in, in light of that. So let me ask you, what does God want you to want? What does God want you to want? This is our fourth week of wrestling with this question. What story does God want to tell with your life? What direction does God want you to go with your life? And in light of that, Okay, considering what God wants you to want, not what you want, but what God wants you to want. What step, what step of faith do you need to take? And I, and I want you to really think about it <clears throat> because it could change your life one day. It could change your kid's life. It could change your life and the people around you. It could change generations if you, if you choose to listen if you choose to take that step of faith and go when it would be easier to stay. Really think about it, because you might miss out on some incredible blessings if you refuse to take that step of faith. So what step of faith do you need to take to want what God wants in your life? Where do you need to go? Now let me be very clear here. Okay, I'm not telling you to leave your marriage to go be with someone else's spouse. Okay, let, let's, let's clear that up. All right, uh, God is never calling you to someone else's spouse. 
I'm not telling you to leave your job and start a business based on your hobby of creating board games called Cones of Dunshire or stop action filming or anything like that. I'm not telling you to go out tomorrow and, and quit your job. Okay, that's stupid. And if you're watching this with someone at home and they're getting that little look in their eye like they're going to go in tomorrow and quit their job, uh, you have my permission to kind of lean over, nudge them and be like, hey, that's stupid. I think he's talking to you. Don't do that. All right. Don't be stupid. Okay. We're talking wisdom here, not stupidity. We're talking faith, not impulsive, reactive type stuff. We're talking taking a step of faith to do something that honors God or that grows his kingdom, something that promotes God, not ourselves, not something that just makes our life easier. We're talking go and do something for God. Based on what God wants you to want, what step of faith do you need to take? Maybe you need to take a step of faith and start serving in your church family. Maybe you need to take a step of faith and start giving. I love hearing people's testimonies about how when they made a commitment to give, the changes they saw in their disciplines, in their finances, and in their health, their, their mental health of their family. And maybe God's calling you to start a ministry, and maybe it's going to start small. Maybe God's calling you to, to start a book, to write a book, to have more kids. Or maybe God's calling you to go into foster care. There's a huge need for that. And I have a, a feeling that when school opens back up, there's going to be an even bigger need for foster parents. Maybe God's calling you to adopt. I don't, I don't know what it is, but I can make a guarantee that God is calling you to fulfill his will in some manner. And it's going to call you to get out of your comfort zone. If, if we're going to fulfill God's will, it's going to take us being willing to die to ourselves, get out of our comfort zone, and do something big for him. Now, as I wrote this message, I consider that there are people who are going to hear this, they're going to listen to it, and they're going to do something with it. In fact, I, I kind of love when I run into people through the week, and, you know, they're like, oh, you know, Andy, boy, I tell you what, you... You know, even stepping on my toes or, man, that message, it's, it's really given me a lot to think about. You know, uh, I, I love running into people like that because I can tell they're, they're kind of wrestling with it. They're, they're dealing with it. Uh, they're working through some things. But I also understand there's going to be people who immediately hear this message and, and they forget all about it. And they just keep scrolling or they go out to lunch or they go do whatever's next on the agenda for the day and they move on. But then there's also a third group. There's a, there's a group of people that are going to hear this, that are going to listen to it. They're going to want to do something. They're going to feel that stirring, that calling from God. But they're not going to do it. Now why? Why would someone, potentially you, hear this, be challenged to take a step of faith, to feel the Holy Spirit stirring you, and then choose not to do anything with it? Well, I, I think it's because sometimes fear is louder than faith. See, faith whispers. When everything else is so loud and overwhelming, faith is there whispering. You know, I, I always kind of viewed faith as a sliding scale. It's not an all or nothing. It's not like you have incredible faith and that's it. You finally arrived. I think, I think faith for so many of us is ever changing. We're growing in our faith, hopefully daily, but sometimes we're regressing. Sometimes we're struggling in our faith too. Consider that scripture says without faith, it is impossible to please God. Consider Abraham. When God called him to leave and to go, how did he do it? Well, Hebrews eleven eight 8 tells us how he did it. He did it by faith. Did he have moments of doubt? I'm sure he did. Consider the promises he received and the time it took to have a kid. And then having a kid and being told to sacrifice your kid. Abraham had faith. There is no mistaking that. But it was a daily choice. Over and over and over again, he was faced with choices. To choose to stay in his comfort zone, to stay with what he knew, or to take a step of faith. I'm sure some days were a lot easier to choose faith than other days. But Abraham, when called to a place to go that he didn't know, how did he do it? He did it by faith. He obeyed by faith over and over and over again. His life, his story, his example, he chose faith. How will you start what God 
has called you to start? It's pretty simple. By faith. How will you go where God has called you to go? By faith. And you may say, you know what, I don't have that type of faith to do those big things. I don't have the type of faith to finish these big, huge things. The great news is you don't have to. You don't have to. Abraham's story, he's told to leave and go to the land he'll show you. The faith he needed was to take the first step, was to start it, right? And and, and then have faith along the journey. You don't have to have faith to finish everything that God has, uh, has, has called you to do. You just have to have faith to start the journey. Just faith to start it. Faith to take the first step and then let God do the rest and build your faith as you go. Like I said, it's not an all or nothing. It's a sliding scale. Hopefully we grow every day in our faith. So we need to have the, t- the faith to take the first step. Don't be afraid to start something because you can't see how you'd possibly ever finish it. Build your faith to take that first step and then watch as God gives you more and more and more faith for each step along the way. So I don't know what step of faith God is calling you to, but one day you're going to tell a story to someone about a time and your story is either going to be, well, God called me from my comfort zone. He called me from my easy life and he called me to do something big, called me to do something bold, called me to do something scary. And by faith, I went and I did it. When it would have been easier to stay in my little bubble, stay in my little cocoon, stay and live my easy life, I stepped out of that. I I, I followed God's stirring, God's calling, and now look what God has done. Or your story can be, by fear, I did nothing. You choose. 